Well, our word for today is different. Different. This is not a message about your roommate, particularly. It's actually about your counselors. No. Just the word different. I, I was hoping that would work, Ryan. The word different means distinct or unlike in nature, form, or quality. Unlike in nature, form, or quality. And I want us to consider this morning that different should be a word that all of us are described by if we are in Christ. We've been talking about the new life that we have in Christ as we look, as we look at the book of Ephesians and this letter that Paul wrote. And we're going to try to do something that's probably nearly impossible this morning. We're going to try to cover about 15 verses in chapter 4. Uh, so we're going to have to skim along them, some of them fairly quickly. But, but I want you to get a picture of, of what Paul is sharing with the church this morning as he encourages them and challenges them to live differently, to allow the realities of the gospel, the, the beautiful realities that they have been redeemed by Christ, that they have been bought with the blood of Christ, that they've been brought into God's family, that they've been adopted as children, right? that they have been made masterpieces in the eyes of their Father in heaven. And now he says that realities, these realities ought to cause us to live lives that are different. Yesterday we, we talked about walking worthy. Right, of this calling that we've been called with. And remember, Paul said, I urge you, right, with, with passion, with energy, with, with a deep desire. Paul wanted these believers to really get it. He, he didn't want them to, to miss out on what God had for them. He, he didn't want them to miss out on this incredible life that they've been called to live in Christ. And he's going to really continue with this, this passion of, of walking worthy. And we're going to see this morning how living different is tied to walking worthy with our lives. We're to live different. To live different. I want us to think about some of the definitions of different. Right, these are just the regular definitions of different, but they, they really tie into our life in Christ. Different means not the same. Right? Our, our life in Christ means that we have a life that should not be the same as it was before we came to know Christ. Different also means unlike in nature. Right? See, you have been given a new nature. Right? Living out this new life, this, this new life in Christ, is not a about conforming through your own behavior or just doing certain things. Right? This is about being changed and transformed from the inside out, which is the beauty of the gospel, right? That, that we don't have to change ourselves, right? That, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. And so as we live different, we live different through the power of the Spirit of God. Different also means distinct, right? And we've been called to live a life distinctly different than those who don't know Christ, right? Our lives should look distinctly different, right? But that's hard. Right, because I don't know about you, but, but I, I, like to, I like to fit in. Anybody want, want, like to fit in? All right, a few of you like not to fit in, probably. But most of us, we like to fit in. Right, we want to be accepted. And, and you know, I, I, wanna, I want you to know that when I came here as a camper, and some of you know some of my story, and I've shared little bits of it, but, but one of the things that God did in my life while I was here was to convict me. That I wasn't living differently. That I lived differently when I was at church where it was easy and I lived differently at home where it was expected. But when I was at school or other places, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be accepted and so I didn't live differently. I tried to copy the patterns of other people's behavior because I thought that would make people like me. That that would make me fit in. Actually, it ended up being a total disaster, right? I still haven't fully recovered from my middle school years, all right? It's tough. But one of the things that God showed me was that, that I wasn't living out who I was in Christ. And it was actually being here and seeing other people my age seeking to live out their identity in Christ and living differently that, that made me want to, to follow Jesus more closely. So we've been called to live different lives, distinct. We've also called to live lives that are separate. Right? Separated to God and for God. Right? Paul saw his life as being separated to God. He, he knew that he says, my life belongs to God. It's not my life anymore. And my life is for God. 
Right? It's for His glory and for His purposes. So, if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 17 and try to get all the way to verse 32. Uh, we'll spend a few more time, uh, a little bit more time on certain verses, and I really want to get to verse 32 uh, as he really hammers home what it looks like to live different. But let's begin with verse 17. Paul says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of of their thinking. So Paul begins this section by saying, he says, you need to live lives that are different. And when he's referring to Gentiles here, he's referring to those that are not saved, those who are not part of God's family. Right? So he's saying, I insist that you don't live like the unsaved world is. And remember, Ephesus was a city where idolatry was prominent. The temple of Artemis, and, or, or also called Diana, was there. So idolatry was a huge thing, and idol worship and sacrifices to idol. Sexual promiscuity was, was rampant. Right? They lived in a very secular culture. And Paul says, if you, as the church, need to realize that, that you've been called to live different, you've been called to live lives that are distinctly and uniquely different because of the gospel. He says, the problem is, is your thinking and their thinking. He says, they live in the futility of their thinking. Futile means a waste of time. How many of you have ever done something and just realized, like, that was a total waste of time? All right, it's frustrating, isn't it? Right, but for most of us, that, that was not something that was a forever thing, right? Well, okay, I wasted some time. I learned from that and moved on. But Paul wants to get us our attention here, right, with that word, because he's saying the way that they're living is a waste of their time, right? And our time is so valuable and so precious. It's, we talked about this yesterday, and we're going to finish up with this on Friday. Like, our time on earth is limited. Now, I'm thankful that in Christ, right, we have eternal life. We're going to live with Him forever and ever in heaven in a new creation one day. But God has given us a season to live here on this earth and He's given you a purpose, right? You are His masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. And He says, if you're going to live out that purpose, we need to realize that we can't waste our time living how we used to in the futility of our thinking. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 Paul said there, he says, do not be conformed to this world, right? Don't pattern your life after the ways of the culture that you live in, right? But it's so easy to do that, isn't it, right? And sometimes it's so tempting and sometimes it seems so good and so appealing. But Paul says, don't do that. Instead, be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, right? Our, our, our behavior patterns always begin with our thinking patterns, right? It's our beliefs that determine our behaviors. We act according to our beliefs. And so Paul is, is wanting us to understand that if we're going to live different, we have to start thinking differently. That the, 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 it has to start in our mind. It's not just about changing some external behaviors. It's not just about a, a, a modification of your behaviors. Right? Christianity is not a behavior modification program. Right? It's not just about, I do this or I don't do this. No, it's about an inward transformation through the power of the Spirit that has to affect our mind. Our beliefs determine our behavior. Let's continue. Look at verse 18. Paul describes a little bit about the unsaved mind. He says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. He's saying that people who don't know Christ, he says, their, their hearts are hard and, and they just don't get it, right? He says, literally that word they're hardening, it, it, has to do, it means a, a stone harder than marble. So he says they, they have hard hearts. This is why some people, despite our attempts, maybe you've had an, a, an opportunity to share your faith with someone and, and you share Jesus with them and they just, they didn't get it. Right? They, they rejected him and they, they maybe even put you down for that and you think, why, why can't they see it, right? And Paul says it's because their hearts are hard. I, I think about so many of the times when, when Jesus was here on earth, right? The God of the universe here in his creation, living among us, and, and he was speaking and teaching and performing miracles. And some people saw and believed and, and gave their lives to him and followed him. But there were other people, even religious people, very religious people, who, who saw Jesus do miracles. They heard his teaching. But they rejected him. Why? Their hearts were hard. Mark chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, this is Jesus. It says, he looked at them in anger. 
These were people who were rejecting him. And he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to this man that he was ready to heal somebody. And the, the reason he was angry and distressed because there were a group of religious people who were just there to see whether he would do something on the Sabbath or not. They were trying to, they didn't care about this man. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. And you would think, right, that seeing someone, someone's hand be miraculously healed in front of you would cause you to say, wow, I want to know more about this man. I want to know more about his teaching. But instead, what did it say? Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Right? See, sometimes our hearts are hard. And listen, we all used to be this way before we came to know Christ. We all used to be this way. Ephesians chapter 2, we talked about it last week. Paul says, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We followed the ways of this world, right? We were far from God, right? But now we've been brought near and we're to live differently. He continues in chapter 4 to talk about the unsaved mind. He says, having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Right, that word sensuality means a vice that throws up all restraint and flaunts itself. And so he says, they, people who don't know Christ, right, they, they live for themselves, they live for pleasure, they live to do whatever they want. Right, and we should expect that. And we shouldn't put them down for that because they don't know Christ. Right, we shouldn't expect people who don't know Christ to live like they do. Instead, we should have compassion Right? The way Jesus did. We should have a desire for us to show Christ to them. But as for us, we've been called to realize that this is not a wise way to live. Because sensuality never satisfies. It only it creates more appetite. Why? Because you were made to be satisfied by your Creator. By relationship with Him. Not any of these other things. And so we, we look for things and we try things, but they never fully satisfy us. And so we should never lose sight of how lost our world is, how much they need Christ. But also to realize if you are in Christ, if you know Jesus, that's not your life anymore. Right? You're in Christ. So look at, look at verse 20. Paul says, I, I want you to get this so that you will live differently. Right? We are called to be different. We're called to a new way of life in the gospel. Verse 20 says, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. For surely you heard of Him and you were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to be put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul's saying, we, we've been changed, we've been set free, he says, you had an old way of life, but you need to put that off. Almost like changing your clothes. He says, you have a different life. And he says, in that old life, there was deception, right? I mean, no one likes to be lied to, right? How many of you would say, I hate being lied to, right? It doesn't feel good to be lied to. To actually have believed someone and then find out that what they were saying isn't true. Well, Paul's saying that our desires, right, our sinful desires have a way of deceiving us. Right? No one lies to you more than you do. No one lies to you more than you do. Right? We tell more lies to ourselves than anyone else has probably ever told us. Right? We, we lie to ourselves so easily. The Bible says our heart is a good liar. Right? It's deceptive. Right? So we have to be careful. Right? Because it's easy sometimes to think that satisfaction and fulfillment and joy and pleasure will come from following the ways of this world or following the sinful impulses of our heart. But Paul wants us to realize that's futile, that it's deceitful. He says instead we're to be made new in the attitude of our minds, that our minds need to be changed, right? that we need to fill our minds with truth, that we need to let the Holy Spirit, through the power of His Word and through the power of Christ, Right? To change our thinking. To renew the way we think. To look at the world differently so that we'll live differently. And our mind is the key. Listen, what you allow in your mind is so important. Right? There's some things that we hear or come across that we can't help. But we get to make a lot of choices about what we take in. And you can't live differently. You can't live a life that's distinct for the Christ if 
you are taking in things that are unholy and are impure and aren't aren't honoring to Christ. Why? Because they're going to shape your thinking. right? And it's not about rules and regulations. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It's about the God who saved you and loved you and gave His Son for you, who's redeemed you and called you His masterpiece and given you the opportunity to live for His glory. Right? And so our our motivation to say, why should I do this? It it isn't about I have to do all these things. It's about I get to do these things. I, I get to live for Jesus and I get to live for His glory. And so Paul goes on and he's going to give us some things that should happen now once we think differently. Look at verse 25. He says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor for we're members of one body. He says, if we are being renewed and living differently, we're going to be honest with each other. That we're not going to live lives of deception and dishonesty. Right? I I think we all get that. Then he says in verse 26 and 27, In your anger... Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. So he says living differently means not stealing, not not being uh, one who, who takes what is not theirs, whether it's property or information, right? Cheating in school, right? Stealing, right? You're stealing someone else's work, right? When you plagiarize a paper, right? You're what? You're stealing. So we live differently. But now he says we need to deal with anger, right? He says that if we're followers of Christ, he says, don't let anger control your life. We all get frustrated in times, right? We all get angry. How many of you have ever been angry before? All right. We've all been there. The point is what we do when that feeling comes. Because anger, he says, is an opportunity for Satan to get a foothold in our life. How many of you are the sort of people that when you see the elevator door about to close, you run and you throw your foot in there? Anybody? All right. How, or, I need hands up high. I need to know who's with me. All right. See, there are a few of us, right? We're the sort of people that stick our foot in the elevator door, right? We don't want to wait. We're impatient. But it's really a picture, he says, of giving the devil a foothold in your life. That when we entertain anger and we don't deal with it, he says, you're giving Satan room in your life to operate. And we can't live differently, so we need to deal with anger. Then he says in verse 28, he says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there on the stealing part. Brain is a little tired this morning. Anybody else a little tired? He says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Right, so he says, don't steal, don't lie, don't be angry. He says, these are some things that that ought to look differently in our lives, right, if we're following Christ. Now, for most of us, right, we, we, these things aren't terribly hard, right? We, we think, I can, you know, not stealing, you know, speaking honestly, right, dealing with anger. Now he's going to go on to one that's a little bit harder. Look at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. For only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That word unwholesome means rotten. He says, don't let rotten words come out of your mouth. Listen, our words are powerful. Right? Solomon said that death and life are in what? The power of the tongue. So every day, you have the opportunity to speak words that are powerful. Words that shape and influence. And he says, as as, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as people who are living differently, as people who are living distinctly, we've been called to talk differently. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Right? Don't use words that tear down, words that destroy. Right? He's not just talking about using curse words. All right? He's not just talking about don't say this word or you can say that word and we have our Christian curse words. Right? He's not talking about that. He's talking about something much bigger. He's talking about the way that we speak about people. Right? If you ever notice that we can use our words to tear people down? Right? Sometimes we do it behind their back and we call it what? Gossip, right? We use our words to destroy and to tear down. We use our words to make fun of, right? That's that's somebody who's made in God's image that you're making fun of. That's somebody whom Jesus died for that you're making fun of. 
And if we're living differently, we need to talk differently. And we need to be careful to say, am I using words that are building up or am I using words that are destroying? He says, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Right? We, we've been called to love each other deeply and how we talk about each other matters. And if you're tearing people down with your words, whether it's your spoken word or texted word or Snapchatted word or picture, right? right? Paul didn't know about Snapchat, but I'm sure he would have included something about it if he did, right? He says, don't use these things to tear people down. Don't use these to make fun of people, even people that you don't like, even people that you disagree with. Right? It's really grieved my heart sometimes how I see believers just making fun of and ridiculing people because they have a difference of opinion or because they believe differently or because they're from a different political party. Right? And that's not right. You can dislike someone's positions. You can disagree with them. That's, that's normal. That's good. You should disagree with some people, right? But you don't have to hate them. You don't have to make fun of them. And you don't have to belittle them. We're going to live differently. We need to speak differently. But here's the thing. I don't want you to just focus on not doing something. I want you to focus on what you are to do, which is to build others up. Every day you can use your words to encourage someone, to bless someone, to pray over someone, to build someone up, to be a blessing. You know, sometimes a few spoken words to someone will totally change their day. How many of you ever had an experience where somebody just said something encouraging to you and it changed your day, right? Listen, all of us, our words are powerful. And so think about it as I get to use my words for good to build others up. Verse 30, Paul goes on. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He says, God lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we sin, it breaks the heart of God. Right? He loves you so much. He, he's rooting for you. You know, as, as a dad, you know, I root for my kids. Right? I want them. You know, there's so many times like, just do the right thing. Right? You, you've got this. Don't, I don't want to punish you. I don't want to discipline you. Right? I, I, as much as you might think your parents enjoy it, right? They probably don't. Right? I, I root for I want them. I'm like, just, no, don't. Don't do that. And I think God in the same way is doing it. But when our children disobey us, when they disrespect us, when they, when they dishonor us, it, it grieves our hearts and it grieves God's heart. It pains God when we sin. And we need to, to realize right, how deeply He loves us right, and how much this matters. And then He says there's some things we need to get rid of. He says get rid of bitterness. Get rid of rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. How many of you have ever been out walking at night and walked through a spider web? How many of you feel like you just need to go take a shower now, right? It's gross, isn't it? It's scary and we're always terrified of what? The spider, right? I mean the web is, it feels gross but the real fear comes with, did this, is the spider on me, right? Is the spider on me? Right, with well, this word, get rid of, it's, it's exactly what you do when you get a spider web. Somebody show me what you do when you get a spider web on you. Yes. <laughs> right? Right, and that's, that's, that's the, the kind of the picture here that, that Paul's painting. He says, there's some things you've got to just get rid of in your life. Bitterness, it comes from unresolved anger. When you've let anger soak in your heart. Rage, it's anger that, that we pour out of our hearts into other people's lives. Right? He uses the word anger there. It's temper, our disposition. It's being more than just being upset about something or mad at something in the moment. He says harsh words, which is anger expressed. Slander, which are words used to injure, with the intent to injure. Malice is evil and wickedness that desires to hurt. Listen, because when we're hurt, we want to hurt back. Right? It's our human nature. When we're hurt, we want to hurt back. Right? We want to settle the score. We want to even things up. And usually we don't just want to even things up. We want to even them up and then what? Pay back a little. Right? That's, that's a natural reaction. But God calls those of us who live differently to have a supernatural reaction. Look at verse 32. And I, I just want us to finish our thoughts here. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Here's the heart of living different. Right? He says, be kind. To be kind. Listen, our world needs kindness. 
Kindness is so powerful. Right? He says we are to be people who are kind. Why? Because Jesus has been kind to us. He says be compassionate, tender-hearted. Right? It's the exact opposite of that, that hard-heartedness that he talked about earlier. Right? Remember he said that the people who didn't know Christ had hearts that were harder than marble? Well now he says you should have a tender heart. Right? That's sensitive to the Spirit of God, that's sensitive to the people around you, that's sensitive to what He wants to do in your life. He says, if we're going to live differently, we need to be kind, we need to be compassionate. And then He says to forgive each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And this is a huge thing, because some of you this morning may be carrying some really, really deep hurts. Some of you have been hurt by somebody. Somebody you trusted, somebody you loved, somebody who should not have hurt you. Somebody who lied to you, somebody who did something to you. Somebody that injured you in some way, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you're hurting. And you think, how can I do this? Forgive each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. But it's exactly what God calls us to do. And listen, I want you to know some things real quickly about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not forgetting, right? How many of you ever told to forgive and forget? That's what they used to tell us, right? That's, that doesn't work. So let's just scratch, forgive, and forget. Because we have great minds, don't we? And they remember everything. Right? So forgiving is, is not forgetting. It's choosing not to hold it against the person any longer. Forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to hold this against you any longer. I'm going to put it into God's hands. Forgiveness is not pretending it didn't matter. Right? Forgiveness is not pretending that it wasn't wrong. Forgiveness is not making light of what happened to you. Forgiveness is not saying it didn't hurt, it didn't matter. Forgiveness is not saying that it wasn't a serious issue. Forgiveness is also not instantaneous. Right? It takes time sometimes. Right? God helps us, but sometimes you have to forgive somebody. Have you ever forgiven somebody and then realized you took it back? Right? You forgave them, but maybe 24 hours later you started thinking, I'm not so sure I really want to forgive them. Right? I think I want to be mad at them. I think I want to, be, I think, I think I want to pay them back. Right? And that's where we have to say, I've got to choose forgiveness again. God, help me to forgive them. It's a choice we have to keep making. And number four, forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook. That's our greatest fear, isn't it? Right? I can't let them off the hook. Forgiveness is realizing you don't have the hook. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to put them in my Father's hands and let God deal with them. Right? God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Right? How many of you say, I think my Father in Heaven can handle it even better than I can? Right? That's what forgiveness is. It's not saying it didn't hurt. It's not saying that it didn't matter. It's not saying that there even needs to be restoration of relationship right away. There may not need to be that. Right? There may need to be distance or space. But forgiveness is saying, I'm going to put it in my hands. Why? Because I'm going to forgive because God, through Christ, forgave me. Right? And ultimately, living different means I treat people the way God treats me. And God has forgiven all of my sin, all of your sin, past, present, and future. It's my prayer for you that you guys would live lives that are different. And what I've prayed for you this morning is that God would show you one specific area that He's wanting you to change. One specific area of your life to say, I think there's an area of my life that's not pleasing to God. Maybe it's something we touched on this morning. Maybe it's something completely different. But one area that I've asked the Holy Spirit to just bring an awareness to your mind and to your heart. To say, this isn't a way that's pleasing to God. I want to live different. You know, for me, one of the big ways was how I talked. How I talked to people. Right? And I talked in a way that I thought would make me look cool or fit in, but it wasn't honoring to Christ. And when I was here, God convicted me. And when I went into my senior year of high school, I started to ask God to help me to talk differently. And I did. Not because I was doing it myself, but because I was relying on Christ and seeking to live for Him. So I don't know what that one thing for you is. But I'm prayed that God would show you that one thing. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you ask God to do that today? God, search my heart. Show me what you want me to do. Would you bow your heads? And just in this moment of, of thought and prayer, how many of you would just say, with no one looking around, just say, you know, there, there really is an area, or maybe more than one, but there's, there's an area in my life that God's convicted me about. Would you pray for me? Because I really do want to live differently, but I know I can't do it myself. Would you pray for me? Anybody? All right. Thank you so much. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the beauty and the power of your word. And Father, I thank you that it reminds us of these incredible truths that you want us to live out. Father, I pray that all of us would live lives that are different and distinct. 
because of what you have done in us. Father, I know it begins in our thinking. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd renew our minds in truth often. And Father, whether that's in reading your word or singing hymns and songs that fill our mind with spiritual truth, whether it's conversations with other believers, renew our minds so that we can live differently. And Father, as so many have indicated that there's an area of a life that they want to change, Father, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give them the spiritual strength to take that step that you're leading them to take. Help them to know that there's forgiveness and grace for where they have failed you and that there's power in the Spirit to live differently. And Father, I pray that we would then live lives that honor and glorify you even more. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.